This video is on class 11, chapter 14, Movements of Ocean Water. In this chapter, we are basically going to understand the vertical and horizontal movements of the ocean water. Then we will read about waves, tides and ocean currents. Then we will further see what are the different types, their importance, their effects and how they are formed. So we will cover all these things one by one in a comprehensive manner. Alright then, with no further ado, let's begin. We all know that the ocean water is never still. It keeps moving here and there. If you look at the world map, all the five oceans, they all run into each other, meaning they are interconnected. For education purpose, we have named them as Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic and Antarctic Ocean. Otherwise, the Earth's oceans are all connected to one another and they together form 70% of Earth's surface. And if you look at the movement of the ocean water, there are two ways the ocean water moves. One is horizontal motion and the other one is vertical motion. When we say horizontal motion, we are talking about the ocean currents and waves which are basically parallel to the ground or running in the same direction. And the vertical motion refers to the tides. Tides are the rise and fall of sea level. This is a vertical motion. And this happens due to the attraction of the sun and the moon. Now before we move further, let's look at some factors that influences the movement of ocean water. Actually this is like the first thing that you will find in this chapter. So what I have done is, I have made a separate video on this topic. It's called Factors Affecting the Movement of Ocean Water. I'll put the video link in the description, make sure you watch it. Let's look at the first topic of this chapter, Waves. I hope you all know what is a wave. Basically, a wave is a to and fro motion, meaning back and forth around a reference point, wherein the energy is moving away from the source in the form of a disturbance. Similarly, when you look at the waves in the ocean, they are actually the energy and not the water. And through this energy, water particles travel. Now the question is, what creates this energy? It's the wind that provides energy. That's why we say wind causes waves to travel in the ocean. If you have to remember this in a simple way, then think of it this way. There are three elements, wind, energy and water. The wind comes, creates an energy and this energy is in the form of a wave. And through this energy, water particles travel. And finally, the energy reaches the shoreline and that's how you enjoy beautiful moments of the seawater hitting your feet. Now I'll explain why does the ocean have waves. First thing you need to understand is that wind pushes the water body. When wind touches the water surface, it creates a wave. And this wave can travel thousands of kilometers in the ocean. And the second thing you need to understand is that gravity also plays an important role. Gravity pulls the water molecules of the ocean downward. When there is a friction between wind and the surface water, it creates a natural disturbance. That's how wave energy is created. Now this wave has a crest. You can also call it as the head portion of the wave. The wave energy always moves in a circular motion. Now when water travels because of this energy, the actual motion of the water is also circular. That means the water goes up and down and this happens in a circular motion. As I said, this is the crest. It is a point on the wave where the water has the maximum upward displacement. And this happens because of the wind. Likewise, there is something called trough. It is the lowest point of the water displacement and it exists because of the gravity. So when the water rises, it forms a crest and when it falls, it forms a trough. And then it pushes the trough up again to become crest. And this goes on over and over again. And that's how waves travel horizontally and keeps moving in a circular motion. Let's look at this box and quickly cover this topic, characteristics of waves. I'm going to simply read all these small definitions that is given in this box and simultaneously I'll show you the illustration. This way you'll have the visual reference along with text. The first one is wave crest and trough. The highest and lowest points of a wave are called the crest and trough. Let me first draw a straight line which represents the sea level. Now this is the crest point and this is the trough point. The second one is wave height. It is the vertical distance from the bottom of a trough to the top of a crest of a wave. This line that you see from the trough which goes all the way up and touches the crest. The third one is wave amplitude. It is one half of the wave height. When we say one half of the wave height, first of all from here to here this is one complete cycle of a wave. 
and one half of the wave height means the height between the sea level and the crest but it is also the depth between the sea level and the trough so don't forget this point wave amplitude is both upward as well as downward the fourth one is wave period it is merely the time interval between two successive wave crest or trough as they pass a fixed point. In simple words, it's the time difference, meaning how much time a wave takes to form the second crest or the second trough. It is simply that time interval and nothing else. The fifth one is wavelength. Don't confuse this with wave period. As I said, wave period is the time difference, but wavelength is the horizontal distance between crest to crest as well as between trough to trough. So remember this difference between wave period and wavelength. The sixth one is wave speed. It is the rate at which the wave moves through the water and it is measured in knots. I'll tell you about this in a moment. The last one is wave frequency. It is the number of waves passing a given point during a one second interval. As I have said, this is one complete cycle of a wave. Now the number of cycle that you can see in one second forms a high frequency wave. Similarly, if there are less cycle, then it forms a low frequency wave. Therefore, the wave frequency totally depends on the wave period. In simple terms, the difference between two crest or two trough determines the frequency of a wave. Now let's get back to the sixth point. Let's see how wave speed is calculated. The wave equation is like this. V is equal to F times lambda. Here V is the speed or velocity of the wave. F is the frequency of the wave and lambda is the wavelength. I've shown you what is frequency and what is wavelength. Wavelength is the distance between two crests or two trough. And frequency is the number of waves travel in one second. If you multiply these two things, you'll get the speed or velocity of the wave. Let's go to the next topic, tides. So what is a tide? It is basically rise and fall of the sea level. It occurs once or twice in a day. And the reason behind that is due to the attraction of the sun and the moon. Now we go to the next topic, types of tide. Now tides are grouped in two categories. One is based on the physical pattern such as frequency, direction and movement. And the second one is based on the position of the sun, moon and the earth, which we have covered moments back. But again, we'll see it. First, let's look at the tides based on physical patterns such as frequency. Now under this, we have three types of tide. The first one is semi-diurnal tide. This is the most common form of tide. It has two high and two low tide each day and they are of the same height. The second one is diurnal tide. In this form of tide, there's only one high and one low tide each day and they are of the same height. So in semi-diurnal tide, there are two high and two low tide each day. Whereas in diurnal tide, there is only one high and one low tide every day. And the third one is mixed tide. By the name mixed, you can figure out that there has to be some variation in terms of height. Now these tides generally may have characteristics of both diurnal and semi-diurnal tides. You'll find most of it occur along the west coast of North America and on many islands of Pacific Ocean. So these were the three types of tide. Now we will look at tides based on the positions of the sun, moon and the earth. As we have already covered this topic, we will run it again. The position of the sun and the moon matters a lot in the formation of tides on earth. The gravitational pull of the moon and the earth acts heavily on the ocean water and that creates a bulge in the ocean and that's how tides are formed. Now under this category, there are two types of tide. The first one is spring tides. Now this type of tide occurs when the sun, the moon and the earth are in a straight line. If you have imagined this picture, then you are half correct. But if you have imagined this as well, then you are in sync with me. Anyhow, since the sun is bigger than all the celestial bodies in our solar system, that means the sun will exert more gravitational pull. Now when we look at these two cases, in case 1, while in a straight line the sun is behind the moon, therefore it will enhance the moon's gravitational pull on earth and that creates much higher tides on this side of the earth. They are called spring tides. Now when the moon is right in front of the sun, you know the rays of the sun will make the moon totally disappear. 
That's how we call it a new moon period, which is Amavasya. In case two, where the moon is on the other side of the earth, both the sides of the earth will witness gravitational pull, and that will create high tides on both the side of the earth. Since the moon is smaller in size than the earth, the rays of the sun hardly has any effect on the moon. That's how the moon is clearly visible in its full form. This is widely known as a full moon period or Purnima. So the conclusion is always remember spring tides occur twice a month. One on full moon period that is during Purnima and another one occurs during new moon period which is during Amavasya. The second type is neap tides. Now this type of tide occurs when the sun and the moon are at right angle to each other. In this position, the sun diminishes the gravitational pull of the moon on earth and the combined forces of the sun and the moon tend to counteract on one another. Now this creates low tides. They are called neap tides. There's a seven day interval between the spring tides and neap tides. If you look at this image, the spring tide occurs when the moon's position is here and here. I hope that makes sense because that's how twice a month you will have full moon and new moon. Now neap tide occurs when the moon's position is here and here. So if you count the number of days from new and full moon phase, you will find seven day interval between the spring tides and neap tides. Alright, so in this entire chapter, one thing that we have read again and again is that the gravitational pull of both the moon and the sun creates massive tides on earth. So first let's see the moon's part. So it takes about 28 days for the moon to complete one orbit around the earth. And during this time period, once in a month the moon's orbit is closest to the earth. It's called perigee. You must have heard the name supermoon. That's when the moon is closest to the earth. And then the obvious thing is going to happen. When moon is closest to the earth, there are unusual high tides in the ocean. During this time, the tidal range is greater than normal because fluids are loose and it gets attracted due to the moon's gravitational pull. And this side of the earth, low tide occurs. Now two weeks later, when the moon is farthest from the earth, it's called apogee. And this time, the moon's gravitational pull is limited and the tidal ranges are less than their average heights. Now earth's orbital pattern around the sun looks like this. When the Earth is closest to the Sun, which is on 3rd Jan, it is called perihelion. What do you think is going to happen? There's going to be high tides and it is also going to be super hot in the Southern Hemisphere because during January, the Northern Hemisphere witnesses winter season. Since we know that the Southern Hemisphere has less land mass compared to Northern Hemisphere, that means ocean in the Southern Hemisphere will have unbelievably high tides. On 4th July, the earth is farthest from the sun. This time is called as aphelion. During this time, the tidal ranges are much less than average. So four things you have to remember. When the moon is closest to the earth, it's called perigee or the super moon period. That's when we will have high tides. And when the moon is farthest from the earth, it's called apogee. That's when we will have low tides. When the earth is closest to the sun, it is called perihelion. That's when we will have high tides. And when the earth is farthest from the sun, it's called aphelion. And that's when we'll have low tides. Just remember these four terms. If you look at the words perigee and perihelion, if you can find the pattern peri is associated with high tides. And the other two words apogee and aphelion, this is associated with low tides. So just remember it this way, you will not get confused. Now here there are these two terms, ebb and flow. Let me quickly explain these as well. Ebb and flow are two phases of the tide or any similar movement of water. The ebb is the outgoing phase, that is when the water level is falling and the flow is the incoming phase when the water rises again. Now we will go to the next topic, importance of tides. We know how tides are caused, right? In this chapter we have read about it again and again. That is the position of the moon, the earth and the sun that causes tides. And nowadays it's easy to predict the position. Therefore it is also easier to predict when there will be high and low tides. Now with this kind of information, there are some advantages which the human society can benefit. And they are, the first one is, tides help in navigation. 
One of the main benefit of high tide is that it helps in navigation. When high tides occur, the water level rises up. This is the time when it is safe for the large ship to enter and leave the harbour. Large ship can easily sail in water when there is high tide. The second advantage is, tides help remove pollutants and circulate nutrients of the ocean planets. You all must be knowing what an estuary is. It is a place where river merges with the ocean water. And this place, you will find a lot of sediments. Because river water carries sediment and discharges into the sea. As a result, quite often, water in estuaries get polluted. High tides help in circulating the polluted water. One more thing about estuaries is that, it is also a breeding area for many water animals and plants. Estuaries are one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. In that context, high tides also move floating animals and plants from estuaries to deeper waters. The third advantage is, tides are used to generate electrical power. You must have heard about tidal energy. It is classified as a renewable energy resource. In tidal energy, there are turbines that are placed below the water surface. Basically, the water currents move the turbines, which in turn activate a generator that produces electricity. Countries like South Korea, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Russia and China have world's biggest tidal power plants. And when it comes to India, most of India forms a peninsula, which means it is surrounded by water on three sides. Therefore, the Indian coastline has an ample opportunity to produce electricity with the help of tidal energy. However, setting up a tidal power plant is an expensive undertaking. As of now in India, there are three places where tidal energy is harnessed. These places are Gulf of Khambat, Gulf of Kutch and Gangetic Delta in Sundarbans. Now we will go to the next topic, ocean currents. Now here it says, Ocean currents are like river flows in oceans. The reason it's called a river flow because ocean currents are continuous and directed movements of ocean water. If you look at the ocean, the water is never still. It keeps moving towards one direction. That's why ocean currents are referred to as river flow. Now we will see what are the forces that influences the ocean currents to flow. I've made a separate video on it. I want you to watch that and it will tell you what you need to know. I have put the link of that video in the description. Please have a look at it. We will now go to the next topic, types of ocean currents. Now they have been classified into two categories, surface current and deep ocean currents. The upper 400 meter of the ocean falls under the category of surface currents and it constitutes about 10% of all the water in the ocean. Usually the surface currents are moved by the winds and they are also exposed to the sun rays, therefore they also get warm quickly and expand. Generally, it is the equator that receives maximum amount of sun rays. Therefore, the water at the equator also warms up and expand, due to which currents develop and the warm water at the equator flows towards the poles and cold water at the poles flow towards the equator. When it comes to deep water currents, they make up the other 90% of the ocean water. These are water movement patterns which are below this ocean surface and do not have any direct influence of the wind. Now the question would be, how deep currents are formed? And the answer is, it is the variation in the density of seawater in terms of temperature and salinity. And if you are wondering how does temperature and salinity creates current, then I suggest that you watch the video, Factors Affecting the Movement of Ocean Water. In that video, the first two points talk about temperature and salinity. So watch that video again and you will get it. The link of that video is there in the description. So this was about ocean currents based on depth. The ocean currents are also classified based on temperature. You must have heard about cold currents and warm currents. This picture over here, the blue arrows represent cold ocean current and the red ones represent warm ocean current. I think this picture is self-explanatory. I don't need to tell you much about it. You can see the blue arrows, that is the cold currents, they bring cold water into warm water areas. One thing that you will notice, most of the cold ocean currents, they are usually found on the west side of the continents, especially in the lower and middle latitude. And if you go to higher latitudes, you'll find the cold currents on the eastern side of the continent. Now the question is, why is it like this? 
and the answer to this question lies in this picture. You must be aware of the westerlies and easterlies trade winds. The westerlies flow from west to east and easterlies flow from east to west. In tropical region, the trade winds flow from east to west. With these winds, the upper water layer of the eastern part of ocean also move towards west. The upper layer of the water is relatively cold in nature. That's why the western coast of continents has cold currents. When it comes to warm currents, they mostly originate at the equator and they move towards cold water areas, that is towards the poles. They are usually observed on the east coast of continents in the low and middle latitudes. Again, if you look at the westerlies and easterlies picture, you will see that the easterlies move from east to west, right? Now look at this picture. As I said, warm ocean currents are generated at the equator and at the equator we have easterlies. The winds move from east to west. So if the surface water has to move because of the easterly trade winds, they will move towards the western side. While doing so, most of the warm currents flow along the edges of the continent. That will be the eastern coast of the continent. So you see how warm currents are usually found on the eastern coast of continent in low and middle latitudes. And if you see the higher latitudes, here we will have to look at the northern hemisphere because the southern hemisphere in high latitude do not have much of land mass when compared to northern hemisphere. In northern hemisphere, you will see at most places, the warm currents is still on the eastern side of the continents. However, at few places, you will find warm currents to be on the western side. And the reason behind that is, when the warm current makes its way towards the pole area, you will see that at most places, the edges of land mass are interlocked. Because of this interlocking, the warm current circulates and forms gyres. And that's how at some places you will find the warm current to be on the western side of the continent in high latitudes. Just to be clear, we have covered this topic, types of ocean currents. One is based on the depth and the other one is based on temperature. Now we go to the next topic, major ocean currents. So moments back we read about different types of ocean currents with respect to their depth and temperature. And I also showed you a picture with those red and blue color arrows that represent warm and cold ocean currents. There are plenty of places on the map that shows warm and cold currents. However, within these currents there are some major ocean currents. And that's what we are going to look at in this topic. Now quickly I need to tell you this. Ocean currents and its pattern is influenced by two major reasons. One is the prevailing winds as we have seen before that the winds are responsible for moving the surface water of the ocean. And then comes Coriolis force. Few minutes back I recommended a video in that I have covered how winds and Coriolis force affect the movement of ocean water. So just watch that video you will understand these points better. Anyhow, as I was saying that the major ocean currents are influenced by the pressure exerted by the prevailing winds and Coriolis force. By watching that video, I'm assuming you must have now understood how. So this part is covered. However, it's written over here that the oceanic circulation pattern roughly corresponds to the Earth's atmospheric circulation pattern. Now what does this mean? When you hear the word atmospheric circulation, you need to understand that it is the large-scale movement of air we are talking about, like Hadley cell, Ferrell cell, subtropical high, subpolar low. I also have a separate video on this where I have explained all these things. So if you're interested, please watch that. Anyhow, it is the wind that moves the ocean current from one place to another. So naturally, the oceanic circulation pattern has a close similarity to the Earth's atmospheric circulation pattern. So basically, if you want to understand this topic in the best possible way, Keep these three pictures side by side. Understand the wind and the atmospheric pattern and then connect it with the ocean currents. You will find close similarities. Once you have these three pictures side by side, watch these two videos which I have told you moments back. The video on your left will tell you all the factors that affect the movement of ocean water. Because once you understand the important factors, and then the video on your right will tell you about the atmospheric circulation pattern. Now these two videos along with these three pictures will make your understanding about ocean currents damn easy. If you read these lines, this is basically the summary of what you will understand if you do what I have asked you to do. And look, the point here is that you don't have to go so much technical about all of this, as long as you don't plan to pursue your further studies in geography. 
I'm assuming many of you want to know about this because you're preparing for some competitive exam or maybe some school exam. So keep all these facts in your mind as well as these three pictures along with two videos that I've asked you to watch. You do all of this, you'll get it. Now let's finish the last topic of this chapter, effects of ocean currents. In this very chapter, if you go back, we read about this topic called importance of tides. Just go back into this video, you will recollect that I have covered three major points as to how the tides are important to the human society. But in this topic, we are talking about the effects of ocean currents. Look, the basic difference between a tide and a current is that a tide is the rise and fall of ocean water. And we know how the rise and fall of the ocean water occur. It is because of the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun, right? I hope you remember that. It is the tide that creates a current in the ocean. So basically, current is a natural flow of water. It is generated due to tide, temperature, wind, salinity, etc. etc. You see, there is a difference. So please understand this difference, alright? Now, when we look at the effects of ocean currents, the only thing that should come to your mind is the mixing of warm and cold ocean currents. For reference, always keep this picture in your mind. You must be familiar with planktons, right? These are living organisms which are made up of both tiny plants and tiny animals that live in large bodies of water. Since they are living beings, they need oxygen. Therefore, the mixing of warm and cold ocean currents creates a perfect temperature that helps to replenish the oxygen and growth of plankton. Another well-known fact is that wherever warm and cold ocean currents meet, those places are considered to be the best fishing grounds of the world. And the reason is very simple. Again, the temperature at these places are exactly right and suitable for phytoplanktons, which is the key source of nutrition in marine food chain. So if we were to see this picture and find out places that are the best fishing ground, then we need to look at places where warm and cold ocean currents meet. These are some highlighted areas. Now I'm sure many of you must be having this question. How do these places exist? In other words, how does cold and warm ocean currents meet? Well, the answer to that has already been discussed. Just go back to the topic, types of ocean currents and see the video again, where I talk about the classification of ocean currents based on temperature. Later on, I may cut that topic and upload it as a separate video for more convenience. Meanwhile, just go back and watch it again. I hope that isn't much of a problem for you. The last point that I want to say before we end this chapter, these places where cold and warm ocean currents meet, here you will find fog. Because the air above warm ocean currents is warm and the air above cold ocean currents is cool. When they meet, condensation of water vapor occur and results in fog. With this, we have come to an end of this chapter. The question answer can be found on the website. Link to that is in the description. I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. As usual, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.